I think one of the things that makes a makes food really delicious, but also makes cooking really fun, is just really playing around with ingredients and seeing how they go together. Mm. And you know, some of that comes through understanding the senses and even things like the basic tastes and understanding flavors and things that will naturally go together. But you kind of need to start trying things to work stuff out. I'm Claire Barry, and this is the Urban Curiosity Podcast, the show that inspires you to slow down and see things differently. Each week, I talk to interesting urbanites about creativity, human connection, and how to thrive in a city addicted to speed. Hello and welcome to the Urban Curiosity Podcast. I'm your host, Claire Barry, and today's guest is Meredith Whiteley. Meredith is a food and flavour lover who connects people to and through food. Her aim is to help people eat in a more mindful, conscious and delicious way. Meredith created Food at Heart for anyone who enjoys exploring taste, discovering new flavours and getting creative in the kitchen, but also wants to develop a more conscious way of eating and living. Hi, Meredith. Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks very much for having me. You're welcome. I can't wait to get into this conversation with you. So you are somebody who is from one part of the world living in a different part of the world. Tell us about where you grew up and how it has influenced the work that you're doing today. Yeah, I mean, as you may be able to tell from my slightly wandering accent, I am Australian, but I've lived in the UK for quite some time. So sometimes people kind of can't quite work out where I'm from. But I grew up in Perth in Western Australia, which is a relatively sizable city. It is probably maybe not as urban as some other cities, but I guess it has that balance of outdoors and city life. And so, you know, that's very much influenced the food that I eat now. And I think especially having grown up in a house where food was important, I had a mum who's a really fantastic cook, but I also had access to you know, all the really wonderful seasonal ingredients that you can get hold of in Australia. And I think even from a really early age, I had a sense of when things were in and out of season and when we used to have cyclones that would suddenly bump the price of food up. So, you know, it was just a really different way of eating. And yes, certainly very different to what I get the impression of the UK was like in the 1970s (laughs) because I was born in the 1970s. So yeah, I suspect the cuisine was a little bit different in Perth. (laughs) (laughs) So where are you living today? So I live just outside London. I lived in London for a large number of years. And, you know, I really, I love London and I love cities. I actually get really excited and inspired by cities. And it was interesting because actually for quite a lot of my childhood, I lived outside of the city. I lived in country towns. And, you know, I'll be honest, I really didn't like it that much (laughs) because I always found a lot more inspiration with the people around me in the city. But I think is the natural thing as you get a little bit older, I need to have the balance of the city and the not so city life. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do and how London inspires it. Yes, so I work with food, as you've explained, and I have a few different ways of, I guess, helping people connect to and through food, as you mentioned in the introduction. And that is one of those is an online program called The Joy of Eating, which basically takes people through the senses, you know, being more connected and more mindful and how you can start using them in cooking in really interesting ways. But I also run cooking workshops and one-to-one sessions. And actually, a lot of my sessions are in London. There's more people there, but people looking for interesting and different things. But also, I think because London has a really exciting food scene and, you know, you do get that in other cities as well. But I mean, I just love even going to markets in London because you get to see all these people doing incredible things with food and flavours and and all the people enjoying eating the food. I think that's one of the other things that I really love. I love seeing people enjoying food because I enjoy food so much as well. And I guess that's also, that was really what gave me the drive to start my business because I just want to help as many people as possible really enjoy food. I love that. So that leads on really beautifully to your burnout story and how that has led you to running this business and having that passion that you've just described for helping people. Yeah, I mean, I've always cooked from a really, really early age. My mum is an amazing cook and we were in the kitchen with her from the time we were very little, mostly with baking. So baking was definitely my gateway to more cooking. And 
I guess it was something that always filled my spare time because actually my working career was not at all related to food. So I studied law at university. I didn't actually end up becoming a lawyer. I ended up working, of course, natural transition to the music industry, not connected at all, but that was my job <laughs> when I moved to London. I then worked in a big market research company for a while. I worked in the public sector doing strategic marketing and then latterly worked in an e-commerce firm. So all sorts of different environments, um, all quite high pressure in their different ways as well. And you know, I guess for me, cooking filled pretty much all my spare time. I would go to cooking classes. I was going to food events. I was cooking in my kitchen at home and just kind of exploring and playing around. And I guess I would really notice the times that I was you know, particularly stressed and working long hours. I really felt the need to cook. But it's amazing. You can keep yourself going uh, even when your body is telling you to stop. And I guess I sort of always knew I wanted to run my own business, but I never felt quite brave enough. And I was always quite enjoying the jobs I was in as well, because, you know, they, they were interesting and they were good jobs, but there was something that wasn't quite missing. And I think, you know, eventually after almost 20 years of working for other people, you know, I, th I actually thought I was okay. And then my digestion, which has always been a little bit dodgy, it just kind of knocked me for sideways. And I'm looking back, I can now see that actually there were loads of small things in my personal and my work life that all just added up to my digestion falling apart, essentially. And I went through a really, really difficult six to 12 months, which, uh, you know, a lot of food, I was finding it very difficult to eat. I was having very severe reactions to it. And that's really hard for someone who enjoys eating and who's always eaten very well. I've always cooked a lot from scratch. You know, I eat organic, I eat with the season. So I'll be honest, I felt a little hard done by. But I think, again, now looking back, I can see it was this real blessing in disguise because while I'd been doing bits and pieces of, you know, doing things like Tai Chi and meditation from time to time, I hadn't really been stepping back and being honest with myself about some, I guess, creative needs and personal needs around slowing down because I'm quite a high energy person. And so it can lead me to be being quite overstimulated. And so my body really forced me to just stop and I had to look at all sorts of things with, you know, the way I was eating, the food I was eating and, you know, my work because that fills up so much of your day. And in taking that step back, I realized that now was the right time to take my next step. And actually, all those issues that I'd had around food and eating were what built my business. So while it was a really, really horrendous 12, actually almost 18 months, you know, without that, I wouldn't have developed what I've done with Food at Heart. I think that's such a familiar story for many of us that we push our bodies past the point of no return in one sense and we don't listen to what it's trying to tell us. But when we're forced to stop and when we then recalibrate, all these fantastic insights emerge. I think it's really important, but much the same as you. It's only in retrospect that you can acknowledge what a powerful, significant moment or period in, in your life that time of burnout was. It certainly is the case for me. So Meredith, these days, how do you, as someone who is running her own business and who is living outside of London, but working in London a lot, how do you make sure you avoid burnout these days? Yeah, and, you know, I guess what, what you don't quite realise is that, you know, it's very idealistic when you first step out of your job and you think, oh, this is amazing, I'm working for myself. Of course, working for yourself is also really difficult, but there's something very different when you can shape the rhythm of your own days. And, you know, I still don't always get it right. In fact, I quite often don't. And I think, again, it's been a real testing and learning experience for me. And there's a few things that I know that I need to do on a regular basis. So I am someone that needs to meditate regularly and not for long periods of time, but I do try and meditate a good few times a week. I do a lot of my own personal writing. I walk, which is really important. And I also, you know, more recently, I'd been spending a lot of time in London because I find London really exciting, as I said, and I find it very inspiring. But actually, I wasn't really giving myself enough downtime to just be with myself. And, you know, again, while working for yourself can sometimes be very lonely and isolating. So it's important to have a balance of being with people and being on your own. I was just overstimulating myself. So I'm now deliberately working from home more often, giving myself time to, if I need to have a quiet day, have a quiet day. Because, you know, my business is all about listening to your body and being in tune with your senses. And so I need to really live that myself as well. And knowing that sometimes it's much easier than others. I've got a lot better at recognizing 
the warning signs. Again, not always, <laughs> but I think you get a little bit better at reading some of the signals. And, and I think, you know, it's trying to be a little kinder to yourself. And again, that can be really difficult at times as well, because you just want to do everything. And I think in a world where there's always so many things going on, and I guess that's the blessing and the curse of being in a big city is because you've got all these opportunities and all this wonderful stuff you could be doing. But actually, if you do do it all, you will burn out again. And so that's been a pretty hard lesson for me to learn, because I guess I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And I think in the beginning, especially as you're trying to formulate your business, you just say yes to so many things, because mm. it's kind of the right thing to do as you're exploring mm. as well. But because you also need to work out the things that do and don't work for you and the things that do actually genuinely inspire you and things that are a bit more ho-hum. So again, I think it's you going through that next stage of working out what is right for you at this stage in your life. And, you know, I think it is just a matter of trying a few things, but just making sure that there's some level of quiet reflection mm. time, whatever that means for you. That's excellent. So you mentioned there meditation, writing and walking. Mm. Will you tell us a little bit more about your meditation practice and any tips or recommendations you might be able to share for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I actually use just really simple things on YouTube. I mean, like, for example, I had, I've searched morning mindfulness meditation and there's a couple I found that I really like. I mean, I have actually done a lot of meditation in previous life and all sorts of guises and particularly when I did Tai Chi. Mm. So kind of finding the sorts of things that do and don't work for you. I actually quite like guided meditations for me. I find that quite helpful just to keep me focused because I am someone with a wandering brain <laughs> as with so many people. But I, I, I am a definitely a wandering mind person and and very occasionally I'll feel the need to do it longer. But actually, for me, probably a longer meditation is more of a walking outside meditation. So because I've got the benefit of living outside London, but again, you can do it in green spaces in London. I find somewhere that's a green space and I walk very deliberately without thinking about work and just kind of let my mind a little bit loose. So those are the two things. And I should have mentioned, actually, probably the other thing that is really important for me, funnily enough, it is cooking. I mean, I think cooking is the other thing for me to do, but I, I I also have to make sure that I find time to do fun cooking, which is for me and not for my business, because it is a little bit different. Mm. Um, I think when I'm doing things which are business related, I mean, I'm doing it with a slightly different purpose, but I try and make sure that you know, I do some, particularly baking, actually, I do some stuff which is purely just for me and for fun, for enjoyment and for a creative release. And to share delicious, delicious baked goods with your friends, <laughs> as I am the lucky recipient of. <laughs> I love cooking for people. I love making stuff to give to people. I mean, this is the thing with food. I mean, it, as well as it being this real creative conduit for me I just love that whole connecting thing with mm. people being able to give food to people and I mean even my next door neighbor and um, she works in a local health food store and I was down there the other week buying some ingredients for my workshops and I happened to mention what I was doing and I had some stuff left over from one of the testing recipes that I'd done for my workshop and she and one of the ladies she worked with ended up popping past my house later that evening to take those samples off my hands <laughs> which was lovely so I was like sure it's really nice I mean a, I got to meet a new person and I got to have another chat with my neighbor who I don't always see so you know that I think food is just such a powerful thing in our lives in mm. so many different ways mm. and it's finding the way to channel that in a constructive way and one that is nourishing yeah. for both our body and soul I think that's really important one of the things about your work that I really really love is your flavor experimentation and how you help people on your workshops to really get daring and have fun and to not have any attachment to whether these two odd items that you wouldn't naturally pair with each other, you know, have no attachment to what the outcome might be. Will you tell us a little bit more about that and how you encourage your participants to have fun? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's while I, I love food, sometimes we can be a bit serious about food. And I think, you know, people watch television programs and they must feel like they need to create these picture perfect menus mm. all the time. And that's great to do sometimes. And I love Instagram as much as the next person. But, <laughs> you know, kitchen is just a space to have a load of fun. And I think one of the things that makes, A, makes food really delicious, but also makes cooking really fun is just really playing around with ingredients and seeing how they go together. Mm. And, you know, some of that comes through understanding the senses and even things like the basic tastes and understanding flavors and things that will naturally go together. 
but you kind of need to start trying things to work stuff out. So the fact that most people get really surprised that dried fruit and some dried herbs and a little bit of salt will go together in something sweet. I mean, that's something I would put on chocolate. So I think you're right. I mean, basically what I will do in my workshops is, depending on the theme, I do a lot of chocolate workshops, not just chocolate, but that's my most popular one, funnily enough. (laughs) That's a great ingredient to match. Of course. (laughs) One of my favorite ingredients too. (laughs) You know, I turn up, I will have, for example, my chocolate, and then I bring along my box of tricks which has got herbs and dried fruits and nuts and seeds and seaweed and sumac and Mm. all sorts of amazing herbs and spices and you know I give people a little bit of guidance just you know as a starting point how to taste and to try a few things and with a few suggestions of what they could put together but then pretty much just letting people go wild I mean it's like when you see children in the kitchen and they don't have inhibitions and they'll give things a go I think as adults we can really benefit from tapping into that because you might not like everything but you might discover that something that you really love as well. And that's, again, you don't have to love everything, but it's really important to give things a go and see what you can do because that's the thing kind of, you know, if you've got really stuck with the kind of food that you're cooking, it starts to open your mind to some different things that you could use. But also, even if it's the same dish you've cooked a million times, just adding a squeeze of lemon Mm. or, you know, putting a different herb in it can really, really change the taste of it. So, yeah, you know, it's about fun and play and also, you know, ultimately just making some food that tastes really good as well. Absolutely. And what I really think is great about the work that you do is that it's a benefit to people who are cooks and who are not cooks. It's a benefit to urbanites who may live in a place where there's a tiny kitchen that's ill-equipped or in fact they live in a shared house and you can do these flavour experimentations on a really micro level and have such great fun with it. I love it. Now tell us about, (laughs) in more detail please, tell us about the chocolate workshops that you run <laughs> oh, I just adore chocolate. Um, I use a beautiful British brand called Pump Street, who are something that's called a bean to bar brand. So they buy the cocoa beans direct from the estates, actually, and they make the chocolate from scratch. And we use that chocolate to taste because actually, helpfully, the way that you taste chocolate as a professional is pretty much the same way that you learn about mindful eating. So it's a kind of very happy coincidence. I'm quite pleased it worked out that way. <laughs> but it uses all the senses. So when you're tasting chocolate, as a professional and someone who's comparing lots of chocolates, you would taste it in the same way as you do with mindful eating practice. Mm. So we will always have a bit of tasting. I will teach people how to taste. We'll then try it with a few different combinations of some flavors that I've set. So just like a tiny little bit of Himalayan pink salt with dark chocolate, which is delicious, and then something sweet with it. So you can taste the difference of putting saltiness with the chocolate and sweetness with the chocolate. So then explore, you know, again, my crazy box of tricks that I've mentioned (laughs) and how they can go with chocolates. And then we will always make something in the class. At the moment, because it's it's actually summer here at the moment, so I have a slightly different menu because chocolate will melt. Mm. <laughs> so I'm doing things like a dark sea salt caramel sauce and we're doing a lovely no-bake slice and actually cacao nib pesto. So using cacao nibs and chocolate in savoury dishes. But during the winter, we will make truffles and little thins or mondiants as they're sometimes called because, again, they're really beautiful as a way to use different colours and flavours because, again, I think because chocolate has got such a dark colour, once you start adding things like freeze-dried raspberries, for example, they really pop. So there's a whole lot of beautiful things that you can do with it. So I think chocolate is, it's a really good base to be starting with because it's beautiful to eat on its own, but it's also a really, really beautiful ingredient to match with other flavors because it has hundreds of flavor compounds. So it's more complex than red wine in that respect. So again, there's just a lot that you can do with it. It's a very creative ingredient. But with one little provisor, that that is using good quality, predominantly dark chocolate. So, you know, I think one of the other things that I really care about introducing to is the difference in quality of what happens when you're eating, Mm. you know, either it's something that's organic or sustainable or kind of a really good quality artisan product and why those sorts of things cost a bit more and why the taste is so much better. There's always an element of eating in silence. So we'll always make something in the class that we will sit and eat for a few minutes in total silence just to be together and to really, really focus on the taste and just that extra layer of pleasure that you get when you're actually tasting food properly. Absolutely. And I found on the workshop that I did with you, that eating in silence part, I found the idea of it excruciating, but the reality of it was just thrilling and liberating. I really, really got to enjoy all of the sensations, the crunch, the flavours, and being together in this communal setting, but eating in silence 
was actually a really, really, really mindful practice. And I found it really helped me enjoy the food better. But it also meant that my brain signaled when I was full and all of those positive things. And a simple tip that I've taken away from the workshop is to set my cutlery back mm-hmm. down on the table in between bites. And that has made a huge, huge difference <laughs> to the quantities that I want to eat. And just there's almost something reverential about that. I'm placing these back down because in this moment I'm concentrating on the mouthful that I'm chewing at present. I don't need to hold this cutlery in my hand. I found that that was a really helpful tip that you taught me. Oh, that's good to hear. And I think, do you know, part of that's also a real respect for the production of food mm. because especially something like chocolate, but not even just chocolate. You know, I do salad workshops and other things like that. You know, there's a lot of care and effort that goes in producing our food. And I think sometimes because a lot of our shopping is now really done in the supermarkets, we don't always have that connection with the food and the producers and where it's coming from. Mm. And I think even just giving it that little bit more time and taste, it's just giving that little bit more respect to our food and where it comes from and remembering, remembering that. But yeah, it's interesting because I now do that very naturally because I've been doing classes for a while and I'd kind of slightly out of my own practice as well. But I naturally now put my knife and fork down when I'm eating between mouthfuls. Mm. I eat much more slowly, which is probably not great for the people around me. (laughs) (laughs) I'll find that my husband has kind of eaten. He'll have more food than me and he's finished and I'm only halfway through my dinner. So I, I definitely don't really scoff so much, mm. which is probably a good thing. But yeah, do you know, I genuinely taste so much more. I mean, I've always had a pretty decent palate, but I think with the chocolate and the way that I've been eating, I've really improved my palate and I can taste a lot more and I notice a lot more in food in ways that I just didn't before. That's really interesting. So speaking about food that's seasonal and that's local, what's your attitude around food miles, especially as somebody who is from Australia on the other side of the world and is here Mm. in London in the UK? Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, it's it's a really complex area. And without sort of going into the full complexities of it, I ideally, the best thing that I try to do is eat as locally, as seasonally as possible. However, sometimes things actually can come from a long way and way and be more sustainable, particularly if they've come by boat. So Mm. food miles is not actually always the best measure of whether something is sustainable. So I think a pretty safe tip is you need to eat with the seasons Mm. and eat stuff that's grown locally to wherever you are, then you're going to be doing a pretty good thing. I think that's a good starting point. I think if you're starting to eat things out of season or if you're eating things which are tropical, like bananas, which you just can't grow in the UK, for example, Mm. it's looking for better ways for them to have been shipped. And that's where you can start using things like veggie box deliveries. And you know that they will have been responsible. I think it's sort of finding places where you know they'll have been sustainable sustainably collected and delivered but for me you know I try and go seasonal and local as much as possible I grow a few of my own things I'm a bit of a fair weather gardener I've been more successful with some things than others but you know that's obviously like the absolute ideal and I have an apple tree in my front garden which is amazing because that's almost Mm. like zero food miles so (laughs) that's great obviously not always achievable in a city environment, I mean, you can grow pots on your windowsill and things like that. But um, yeah, I think going to farmers markets is always a really good place to start as well. And there are some really fantastic companies that are helping you navigate that kind of stuff. So companies like Farm Drop, for example, places like the Food Assembly, which are online marketplaces that you can buy things from, and they're all from local producers or within a kind of sort of a mileage range. So I think it's looking for those sorts of things and starting to get to know the people that are producing and selling things, because that's how you find out. I think you need to be a little bit curious because I think sustainability is a big, big issue. It's a big Mm. complicated issue and it can sometimes put people off because it's so complicated. But I think even if it is complex overall, there are still small steps that you can do at a local level that really make a difference. And Mm. I think starting with seasonal, starting with as local as possible when things are in season, but also finding places where you can talk to people and you can find out and just grow your knowledge so that you don't have to feel like you're guessing about things and just saying, oh, well, it's too complicated. I'm not going to do anything. I think that's a bit of a cop out because I think one of the parts of things that I I talk to people about with conscious eating is it is really being curious about not just what you're tasting and the flavors, but where your food comes from, because that's really, really important because I want to to be able to keep eating in the future. And I want, (laughs) you know, our children, children's children to still be able to eat decent food Mm. in the future as well. So we need to be responsible about it. Absolutely. So Meredith, if somebody was coming to London for the first time, where would you send them for something that they absolutely must do or see or taste? 
Oh, do you know, I would send them, and this is a bit of a dodgy thing on a weekend because Borough Market is <laughs> very, very busy. I would send them to South London. I would get them to do a big walk from Borough Market, maybe get a coffee in Borough Market mm. or get there very, very early. Actually, Borough Market is better during the week. But to do a big walk along the food markets, going to Maltby Street Market, and then mm. Druid Street Market mm. and then Spa Terminus. Because <gasps> I think that's just a really interesting stretch of London that's been redeveloped. Yeah. Um, certainly, you know, I've lived in and around London for 19 years or so and there were certain areas that you just never went when I first came to London and now they're these really you know thriving places that attract all sorts of different people as well which is fascinating so you get to see the people as well as the food so mm. I would definitely that stretch from London Bridge over to Spa Terminus just really really cool and then I think during the week kind of wandering in and around little areas like the top of Brick Lane and into Shoreditch um, even the top of you know Fitzrovia so north mm. of Oxford Street there's these really cool little pockets of places popping up with little cafes and you know as an antipodean i'm very pleased that there are now many many good places to get coffee that was not the case before I came to london that is a huge relief for me and me <laughs> yeah. as a coffee snob it's a, a very important matter in my world too <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the other thing I would say to do as a chocolate lover is that there are little areas of London where you can do, I mean, I on the side have done chocolate guiding for another company, but find little chocolate shops, find little boutique places mm. selling really interesting ingredients and foods that they really specialize in and buy yourself like a macaron or a single <gasps> chocolate or something like that. Mm. And just something that's a real treat that you're really going to savor as well. So you don't need to get yourself a family size bar of Galaxy or Cadbury Dairy Milk. I mean, mm. you can get that anywhere, but you know, you go to London and you can visit places like you know, Rococo or there are places like Paul A. Young. Mm, I love Right this in place. the middle of Soho. Yeah, yes. Like amazing flavours, like endlessly inspiring. And yeah. there's even little secret tip for London. There's a chocolate counter and pastry counter at the back of Yawacha in the middle of Soho. Mm. And you can actually go in and buy loose chocolates and pastries. People don't always realise. They think you need to go in there too. And the restaurant's also very nice. But that's just a little chocolate tip if you're into chocolate and pastries. Fantastic. You know me well, chocolate and pastries and quality <laughs> coffee. <laughs> so Meredith, a couple of other questions before we finish up today. I would love to know how somebody who's listening today might be able to learn more about your work, even though they may not be in the UK and they may not be able to attend one of your live workshops. So I have my website, foodatheart.co.uk. And actually, the, the main part of my business now is my online program, um, The Joy of Eating. And that really brings together a lot of the things that I've talked about today, really working through the different senses, how they're involved in taste, how you can start using them in the kitchen, how you can start thinking about conscious purchasing and eating and then eating things in a more kind of conscious and mindful way. So that's all online. And I even have a free course for people that want to get a little taster, excuse mm. the pun, <laughs> what I'm doing, <laughs> what I did there. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called Five Days and Five Senses. And again, it's just little tiny activities to go through because, you know, I think one of the things that amazes me about food, and even though I'm doing these most days, I'm still really surprised at how even I find these things, these little stop moments that you can give yourself in your day, whether it's taking a couple of breaths before you pause and eat, you're sitting for a minute with a cup of tea just on your own or even at your desk somewhere quiet. Or, you know, I think one of the things I was talking about this week is my little biscuit recipe that I've made and kind of making some biscuits and sitting down with a little biscuit and just really eating it with thought and love and really enjoying it and all of that I mean you can find a lot of the stuff on my website but the joy of eating is very much because I wanted to spread the message beyond people that are just able to work with me one-to-one -one or in my workshops mm. you know and this is applicable for anyone that lives anywhere in the world pretty much because our senses are our senses it doesn't kind of really matter whether you live in a city or the countryside and you know I'm really interested in what you can do with ingredients and flavors that you can get locally and mm. you know trying those sorts of things out that's fantastic so that's a good point to ask you a quick question around travel and the importance of travel on your well-being, but also how it influences your work. I love traveling. I always have done. And I don't know whether that's sort of the slight wanderlust that maybe comes with being Australian. I think we just sort of naturally seem to want to travel, <laughs> possibly partly because we have such a large country so that you mm. can actually travel quite a long distance and a long way and not get very far. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, yeah, I mean, it was interesting because I had a year where I actually didn't really travel at all when I first set up my business. And by the end of that year, I was just desperate to go and see other places because I find the cuisine and people's culture and the way people use food and live just endlessly inspiring. But I think it's also good to put your own life into some perspective sometimes Mm. as well. And, you know, I've had the privilege of traveling through most of the continents, actually. Unfortunately, I haven't made it to um, Antarctica yet or... (laughs) South Pole are still on my list of places to visit at some point, maybe in the future. But, you know, I think having traveled around, you know, places like India and parts of Southeast Asia and South America, I get really, really inspired by the flavors and seeing how people prepare food, but also seeing how food is part of people's lives and the way that they use it and even the generosity of sharing it as well. It's um, You learn a lot about a culture through the food and the way that they eat and and also just the flavors. I just, I love the flavors of traveling. And I think I really like food in the UK. And I think, you know, as I said, London's got a really amazing food scene. And it's great because you can actually access so many different cuisines mm. now. So, you know, you don't have to travel halfway around the world to eat really good food. But there's something very different about eating a food in a place that it's from mm. in warm temperature. <laughs> Yeah, that's always nice. (laughs) And, you know, as much as possible, I do try and go to cooking classes when I'm traveling as well. Again, it's just, you know, you get to see the way that things are made. I I always bring back little tips. And I I was in Vietnam recently for a big birthday. I won't mention which one it was. (laughs) Hey, happy birthday. (laughs) Thank you. And they had this amazing thing, which was a morning glory cutter, which morning glory is these very kind of thin stalks that's in a lot of Vietnamese food. And then they have huge, huge amounts of flavor, but they're kind of quite crispy and nice. This amazing little cutter that just sliced things I was like wow you could use that with spring onions it's so exciting I was possibly the most excited person I've ever had in their class about discovering this new cutter that I'd never come across so you know <laughs> and I like seeing the way that people use their hands in the preparation of food as well because again it's just a little bit different with different countries and the way mm. that they use foods and flavors and I always tend to bring back little packets of herbs or spices or something when I've been traveling around so it's important but I think it's also important for anyone who's running a business to have that physical time away because it's very all-encompassing and particularly when you're doing something that you really love Mm. so it can be difficult because you almost you know you don't want to step away from it but having that physical distance is really really important and you know that's even in the UK I love traveling around the UK I think within a very short geographical space you know you go up north and you see different food and different Mm. names um, and things prepared in different ways so it's not like you have to travel a long way to experience it either but I do think it's really important to do that from a personal and a business perspective really. Mm, Wonderful so Meredith our last question is what are you curious about right now so the thing that I'm particularly curious about is I'm in the process I have a very small back garden but I am redesigning it at the moment because it was looking not particularly fantastic (laughs) so I'm looking at all sorts of different plants that I can put in there and I'm going to be doing a load of edibles and not just I guess previously I've grown fruit and vegetables and things like that I'm actually wanting to explore some more unusual herbs and things with flowers that I can use so I can have some more edible flowers because I love the colors of those Mm. so I'm just to the point I'm researching all sorts of different plants so some will be edible some won't be so I want to have a real sensory garden so I'm really really excited about that I mean I'll see I think it will help me also maybe be a little bit more determined with my gardening and not give up halfway through I'm hoping this is the thing is I just love learning so much I love learning new things all the time but Mm. I'm really excited about the thought of being able to just step out my back door and grab some unusual flavors that I don't always use fresh in my cooking sometimes I'll have dried versions I want to play around with those so I'm really really looking forward to doing that oh well if you ever need a tester for um quality control or <laughs> tasting purposes you know where i am you will be my first person on call. <laughs> meredith it's been so much fun to talk to you today thanks very much for being on the urban curiosity podcast you're so welcome thank you very much for having me thank you for listening to the urban curiosity podcast get the show notes and more at urbancuriosity.co.uk forward slash podcast If you found today's episode inspiring, please head on over to iTunes now and subscribe. If the stories and ideas in the show moved you, please leave a review or a five-star rating. Until next time, remember this, a curious life is an extraordinary life. I'm Claire Barry, signing off for Urban Curiosity.